Okay, hello, Dr. Lloyd here. This is uh, chapter 12, the central nervous system. This chapter has a lot of information in it, and so I would, I would be selective and uh, try to read the questions, sample questions, before you dive into the chapter so you know the uh, depth that we're looking at. But uh, let me guide you through it. Just some directional anatomy. So looking at the brain uh, from above would be superior or dorsal and for lo from below would be inferior or ventral. The uh, posterior or back of the brain is also caudal. This is like tail, the tail of the brain. And then the front of the brain is anterior and also called rostral. So we have uh, another view uh, showing dorsal and ventral, rostral, caudal, superior, inferior. We've got yet another one. Uh, showing the anterior portion as being ventral, posterior as being dorsal. So there's a little bit of variety there. Okay, let's dive right in. So in the embryonic development of the human brain, the brain starts as a neural tube, uh, which is just uh, a straight tube, rostral and caudal. Uh, then in development, brain vesicles start to form you, get, you start to get brain regions like the forebrain, which is the prosencephalon. Encephalon means brain. Uh, the midbrain, which is the mesencephalon. And the hindbrain, which is the robencephalon. Now, in, uh, in development, the secondary structures develop from the prosencephalon. Uh, this will be the telencephalon and the diencephalon. The telencephalon will eventually form the cerebrum, uh, the cortex, white matter, and, and basal nuclei, as well as the lateral ventricles, whereas the diencephalon will form the thalamus, hypothalamus, epithalamus, and retina, and the third ventricle. And then the uh, mesencephalon will form uh, the brainstem and the midbrain, as well as the cerebral aqueduct. The metencephalon will uh, make the pons and cerebellum, and fourth ventricle ventricle along with the myelencephalon, which would create the medulla oblongata and the fourth ventricle. Okay, so uh, in development there are also some flexures that happen and uh, two flexures that we're looking at here um, cause the telencephalon and the diencephalon to angle towards the brain stem. Okay, so this would be the cervical and midbrain flexures. At about 13 weeks, the cerebral hemispheres develop and grow posterior laterally, which, uh, which these arrows show it, posterior laterally, to enclose the diencephalon and the rostral brain stem. Here we can see uh, the cerebrum, the midbrain, the pons, medulla, spinal cord, as well as the cerebellum. Okay, uh, we've got the, at, at birth, actually, we've got a, a semi-mature brain. Um, it's got an adult pattern structure with the different convolutions. We've got the cerebral hemisphere, the major portion uh, of the telencephalon. Telencephalon just means end brain, and so that's the, uh, that, that's as far as we go. Um, so the diencephalon would be uh, part of the midbrain. And here we show uh, the cerebellum. And then the brainstem, which is made up of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. There's a distribution of gray and white matter. Now, let's talk about what gray matter actually means. So. The gray matter is gray because of the cell bodies present. These are the neurons in which the cell bodies are resident. Um, and then you have long axonal projections, which wake it, wake, make up the white matter. And so the gray matter is the cell bodies, or the soma, of the neurons, whereas the white matter is mostly myelinated axons. Uh, as we as we progress 
up the and, and so here here's a cross section of the spinal cord showing uh, the central cavity and inner gray matter the outer white matter as we progress up towards the brain stem we've got uh, a central canal which is the fourth ventricle uh, there are four ventricles total and so this one slices through the fourth ventricle we still see our inner gray matter and our outer white matter and then if we uh, take a slice through the uh, the cerebrum we can see the central cavity which is lateral ventricle uh, a lot of white matter and and there are tracts that we'll get into and then gray matter which is going to, and, and the gray matter can form these nuclei and um, these would be deep nuclei but they're gray matter so they're cell bodies they're not axonal projections okay so there are ventricles in the brain which um, are communicating networks of cavities filled with cerebral spinal fluid located within the brain parenchyma. There are four ventricles. There's the lateral ventricle, the third ventricle, the cerebral aqueduct, and the fourth ventricle. So the brain has lobes, sulci, fissures, and hemispheres. So we have a longitudinal fissure that uh, is where both hemispheres meet. We've got a frontal lobe, parietal lobe, uh, temporal lobe, and occipital lobe. Excuse me. Okay. So here is a better picture of the the frontal lobe, which is outlined, the parietal lobe, temporal lobe, and occipital lobe, as well as the cerebellum. We can see the brain stem. So the uh, sulcus or sulci are folds, and the gyrus or the gyri are out pockets. Okay, so you have the bumps and you have the folds, and so the bumps are the the gyri and the uh, folds are the sulci. Um, and so we've got our frontal lobe uh, separated from the parietal lobe with the central sulcus. And adjacent to the central sulcus, we have the precentral gyrus, uh, which is part of the frontal lobe, and the postcentral gyrus, which is part of the parietal lobe. Uh, we've got a parietal occipital sulcus, which divides the parietal and occipital lobes. Um, let's see. Okay, and so this little slice shows the uh, deep fissures or deep sulcus and the, the gyrus or the ridge. And we've got the gray matter on the, uh, the surface with white matter projections deep. Okay, um, if, uh, if, you, if you dissect away the, the frontal lobe, um, underneath it is the insula, and the insula are believed to be involved in consciousness and play a diverse role in emotions and the regulation of homeostasis. These would include compassion, empathy, taste, perception, motor control, self-awareness, cognitive function, interpersonal experience, and awareness of homeostatic emotions such as hunger, pain, and fatigue. So these are the insula or insular lobe, uh, deep uh, to the uh, frontal lobe. This looks like a repeat. Okay, so um, just a side point, functional MRI or functional magnetic resonance imaging is uh, a way of imaging the brain um, to look at blood flow. And the idea is that if an area of the brain is being activated, it will need corresponding flow in blood or a, a, a local uh, vasodilation to increase blood flow. That vasodilation increase in flow can be picked up on the MRI. 
And so you can visualize the, in the awake state, the uh, location of certain modalities like seeing, hearing, speaking, or thinking. So fMRI is a very, very useful tool. Okay, um, there are uh, motor areas and sensory areas. And so if you look at the central sulcus, um, uh, anterior to it is the, uh, the motor cortex. And um, there are other areas uh, called like Broca's area, which would be for speech. There's uh, anterior association cortices, which the association cortices are, are really drawn upon for memory, executive function, uh, problem solving, task, uh, multitasking. Then posterior to the central sulcus, we have the uh, sensory cortex or uh, primary somatosensory cortex, and then uh, various association cortices um, like uh, Wernicke's area, which would be uh, for, uh, looks like for taste. And then we've got hearing and vision. Uh, hearing is, is uh, very deep within the brain, whereas vision would be towards the caudal portion of the occipital lobe. Now we can make body maps. These are called homunculus and homunculus really means small human. Um, and so the different areas of the primary motor and somatosensory cortices uh, will um, code for various areas of the body. And the larger the area covered, uh, the more innervation you have. So you can see, for example, the mouth and the lips has a pretty large area of cortex assigned to it, indicating that it is a very sensitive area. Uh, and, and that would be for sensory. For motor, it takes a lot of neurons to fire to get speech and movement of your lips and your tongue. And so this homunculus uh, shows the, the amount of innervation that each body part gets uh, from its motor cortex or its sensory cortex. And once again, the primary motor cortex is located at the precentral gyrus, whereas the primary somatosensory cortex is located in the postsensory gyrus. And so that's what you have here. You have the presensory gyrus and the postsensory gyrus shown in red and blue. Okay, here's uh, another look at some functional and structural areas of the cortex. So we've got the premotor cortex, uh, the primary motor cortex, the central sulcus, then the somatosensory cortex, um, and uh, different association cortices. Oh, I'm gonna skip this, okay. Um, just a few other notes for the for the sensory is the somatosensory cortex. There is a sensation, taste, equilibrium. Whereas in the primary visual cortex, there's vision, and then uh, deep we have uh, the auditory cortices for hearing. Now the white, fiber, the white fiber forms tracks as the axons are projected from one nuclei to the next. And uh, you can't really see these tracks when looking at um, a cross section of the central nervous system, but they're there. And so there are various tracks. When the tracks cross over, it's called a decussation. And crossing over is very common in, in the brain crosses over from the left hemisphere to the right or the right hemisphere to the left. In between, uh, there is a, a very thick 
white fiber tract called the corpus callosum, which uh, bridges the two hemispheres left and right. Uh, we also have the internal capsule, which is a long stretch of, of white matter. Uh, this would be axonal projections. Okay, and now the association fibers are recruited uh, for associations. And so it's, it's part of memory, to associating one thing with another. Um, it, they're, they, they are loosely mapped. Okay, also there's an internal capsule, another projection of white matter. Okay, so deep within the brain is the basal nuclei, and this uh, is the striatum composed of the caudate and the putamen, as well as the thalamus and then the uh, the tail of the caudate nucleus. So the basal ganglia or a basal nuclei is a group of subcortical nuclei and so this would be uh, gray matter that is deep within the brain not on the surface which would be your cortical gray matter. So the basal ganglia is very deep subcortical area. Here's another look at the basal ganglia, uh, looking at the putamen, the globus pilatus, the caudate. Uh, you can also see the uh, third ventricle. Okay, so this is a sagittal or mid-sagittal section showing the uh, cerebral cortex. Um, and then deep to that, we've got the thalamus. Uh, inferior to the thalamus, we've got the hypothalamus. Um, posterior, we've got the epithalamus. Then the midbrain, the pons and medulla. So we talked a little bit about the telencephalon, which is the end brain. That's the that's the uh, as far as the brain gets. Uh, the next level will be the diencephalon, and there are a number of nuclei that make up the diencephalon. This is very deep, but there is a medial geniculate body and a lateral geniculate body. Also, uh, paraventricular nuclei, uh, which contains uh, supraoptic, suprachiasmatic nuclei, a mammary body. These are very complex regions deep within the diencephalon. And just another picture. It looks like a repeat. Okay. So three views of the brain stem. Now the diencephalon is made up of the thalamus and the hypothalamus. Once again, the telencephalon is the cerebral cortex. Then the brain stem is made up of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. There are a number of cranial nerves that you can see coming off. They're just numbered. So the, the first cranial nerve, I believe, is I believe is optic. I'm just not seeing it. Uh, it looks like optic nerve is two, ocular motor three. We're, we're going to go over these uh, subsequently. Another look at the diencephalon. I'm just going to skip this. Okay, so here is an actual uh, brain. So we can see this is. Uh, this is inferior view, so from below, but we can see uh, a number of uh, cranial nerves coming off. We've got the, the optic nerve, so the olfactory is, is, is the first cranial nerve, uh, and this one is, is the most uh, rostral, or the most in front or anterior portion of the brain. 
We've got the uh, second, which is the optic nerve, um, and this this just progresses. Okay, this is a mid sagittal view showing the um, the cerebral hemispheres, corpus callosum, which is going to connect the hemispheres, the thalamus, which also makes up the third part of the third ventricle, the epithalamus posterior to it, then uh, inferior the midbrain, well first the hypothalamus and the midbrain. And looks like just another repeat here. Let's skip through this. Okay, so the uh, cerebellum is a, uh, a, a cortex for like fine motor movements. And uh, there are different cerebral peduncles, or these are the, uh, the portions. There's a cerebral middle and inferior peduncle. There's an anterior lobe, uh, a cerebellar cortex, and then this tree-like structure, which is called the arbor vitae, the posterior lobe. And you can make out a little bit of the choroid plexus of the fourth ventricle. Now, each ventricle has their own choroid plexus that makes cerebral spinal fluid. The cerebellum, uh, since it is involved with movement, you can uh, make a homunculus uh, for the different regions, and this is your different homunculi. So we can see that there is a lot of uh, innervation with the foot and the hand and the face. Okay, the limbic system. This is the portion of the brain that deals with emotions and memory and arousal or stimulation. And there are several parts that make up the limbic system. Uh, there are different fiber tracts that, that make up the fornix and the anterior commissure. And uh, there is a reticular activating system, which is a, one of the ways that the cerebral cortex stays active is from continuous stimulation from uh, the medulla. And so the sensory axons uh, will synapse in what's called the reticular activating system of the brainstem. And these brainstem uh, neurons then relay to the cerebrum through the thalamus. And it's a continual stream of sensory stimuli that keeps the cerebrum alert and awake. So this is called the reticular activating system. Different functional and structural areas of the cortex. Uh, we've talked about it just a little bit, uh, but we've got the primary motor cortex, uh, which includes uh, Broca's area, which would be area of speech. We've got the sensory cortex, which includes somatic sensation, soma means body, includes taste and equilibrium, vision and hearing. The prefrontal cortex also has uh, an interior association area for working memory and executive function. Okay, so you can use uh, electrodes to get uh, to to get uh, brainwave information, and it's called the electroencephalogram, or encephalography. But uh, there are different waves. We've got four waves, alpha, beta, theta, and delta. Now, the alpha waves are your awake but relaxed waves. Uh, the beta waves are, are uh, awake but alert. Theta waves are more common in children. And then the delta waves are for deep sleep. And there are stages of sleep. So the first stage is the awake stage. And uh, then we've got a REM stage, which is a rapid eye movement. In, in REM stage, it's interesting, the skeletal muscles are actually paralyzed. 
so that we don't act out our dreams. And then there are non-REM stages. These are deep sleep, slow wave sleep, stages one, two, and three, and four. Different waves for each stage. And if you look at a typical night, let's say seven hours, uh, one might cycle from the awake to, uh, to stage four, a slow wave sleep, back to REM, down to stage four, back to REM, to stage three, back to REM, to stage two, back to REM. And so there's cycling through the night and you would form memories in each REM stage. Most of the time you form memories. Okay, let's look at the coverings of the brain. So there are meninges, which are protective coverings. These, these include the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. So they're in that order. The dura mater is the most uh, superficial, and then we've got the arachnoid mater and the pia mater. Now the pia mater has a lot of blood vessels uh, intertwined with it, and um, when, when you're dissecting these layers out, you can actually just pull on the layer, like the dura is very, very tough, and you can get a pair of forceps and, and pull that, that layer right off, um, as well as the arachnoid mater. The pia mater is a little bit more difficult because it does innervate into the cerebral cortex, uh, and it produces or it supplies a lot of vasculature the, uh, the brain surface is highly vascularized. This is why cuts to the scalp just don't stop bleeding. They just bleed and bleed and bleed. And it's just because we have so many different vessels there. Okay. So let's look at cerebral spinal fluid. And this gets into our, our aqueducts as well. But there's a choroid plexus as part of each ventricle, there are four ventricles, and these produce the cerebral spinal fluid. The cerebral spinal fluid flows through the ventricles and into the subarachnoid space. Uh, so we can see that movement here. Um, the CSF flows through the subarachnoid space. Uh, CSF is then absorbed into the uh, dura venous stenosis. and that's its movement. So the cerebral spinal fluid is created by ependymal cells, which are supporting cells. These are, these are part of your, your, your glial cells. And so they're going to produce the cerebral spinal fluid. And each ventricle system, therefore, will have their own choroid plexus, their own ependymal cells, that create their own CSF. Uh, just a quick note, there is also a blood-brain barrier. Now this is at the level of the vasculature made up of pericytes and astrocytes. And these two supporting cells or glial cells um, make a very tight seal that will block the systemic blood from reaching the brain. And uh, not much crosses this, this blood-brain barrier. And so there are tight junctions between the endothelial cells, which are the key structures of the blood-brain barrier. There are lipid-soluble species, however, that, that are able to cross as well as, as, well as uh, your typical gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide. Okay, let's look at the spinal cord. And uh, so the spinal cord, we've got uh, a cervical enlargement and uh, cervical spinal nerves. Then we've got uh, different thoracic nerves that come off. You can see the ganglia there. We've got a lumbar enlargement, and then uh, a conus medullaris, and a cauda equina, and a phylum 
terminale. And so these are just portions of the spinal cord as, they, as the spinal cord terminates in the sacrum. So the conus medullarius is, is just part of the spinal cord. The cauda equina are the fibers that come off, kind of like a horse's tail. And the phylum terminale is the, is the end of the spinal cord. I didn't mention, but you, you also have lumbar spinal nerves as well as sacral spinal nerves. So the spinal cord segments, you have uh, the, the posterior or dorsal and anterior or ventral. And the different uh, spinal nerves are numbered. If we look at the spinal cord itself, we've got the, uh, the vertebrae to uh, orient you with uh, the vertebral body, uh, different processes, and the spinal cord on the interior. There is a subarachnoid space, uh, which contains cerebral spinal fluid, a subdural space, and an epidural space. And so you can imagine these are between the different meninges. And so we've got the epidural space, then the dura mater, then the uh, subdural space, and the arachnoid mater, the subarachnoid space. And we can see also the dorsal root ganglion here present. Okay, another look showing the, uh, the dorsal root ganglia as well as the ventral root. We'll go more into this later. We can also make out the median sulcus in the middle. There are various commissures, which are crossings. Uh, this gray commissure uh, is, is, uh, makes up a, a number of cell bodies, part of the uh, dorsal horn, the ventral horn, and lateral horn. Okay, so if we take a closer look, we've got uh, sensory information coming in. This is the afferent, and there's a, a, a dorsal root ganglion, and a dorsal root, which is the sensory information. This is going to then uh, synapse with an interneuron in the spinal cord gray matter, and then output through the ventral root to the uh, motor effectors, which would be your efferent pathway. And so in between, you've got interneurons that receive input from the, the somatic sensory neurons. And so these, the sensory neurons are what's coming into your dorsal root. And then your, uh, your output into your motor neurons. There are various tracks that contain sensory information. These are going to be ascending tracks. And so the uh, sensory information from the body uh, will be uh, received in a number of nuclei, but there, there are these white matter tracks like the dorsal white column, the spinal cerebellar tracts, and the spinal thalamic tracts. And then the motor pathways that descend are going to be like the corticospinal tracts, which are pyramidal tracts, the rubrospinal tracts, the reticulospinal tracts, vestibulospinal tracts, and the tectospinal tracts. So I just I want you to appreciate these. So there are ascending pathways, which are sensory, and descending pathways, which are motor. These pathways can get quite complex. Uh, so we've got the spinocerebellar pathway, 
and the dorsal column mediated lumniscal pathway, uh, which would be sensory and the spinothalamic pathway. This might include pain receptors. Okay, so I've got a number of tables which uh, are good just to get the basic information from. But the dorsal column or the medial uh, lumniscus pathway, this is the uh, sensory, mostly first order neurons uh, of the dorsal root of the spinal cord branch. Then we've got the lateral spinothalamic pathway as well as the ventral spinothalamic pathway. These are lateral and ventral in location. Two more uh, ascending pathways, the dorsal spinal cerebellar and the ventral spinal cerebellar pathways. And then we look at the uh, descending. There's a pyramidal uh, pathway, which is lateral and ventral cortical spinal pathways. A lot of new terms here, but I just want you to appreciate them. And I do want you to know about, you know, so you can identify different areas as white or gray matter, like the internal capsule. This is going to be white matter tract. Okay, so there are different pathways that influence movement, and these are going to be in the rubrospinal tract. So the major descending pathways or motor pathways are the lateral cortical spinal and the ventral cortical spinal tract. As well as the tectospinal, vestibulo, spinal, rubrospinal, and reticulospinal. I'm going really quickly through these. Okay, so that is the uh, chapter in a nutshell. And uh, I will see you in class. All right, see you then.